Go to the phones. We got Connor O'Gara with us, the national senior columnist at Saturday Down South. Get to talk to him every couple of Mondays. Happy Monday, Connor. Are you brushed up on your um, on your SEC tiebreakers? Because you may have to go all the way to the bottom of them in a couple of weeks. Are we going to flip a coin? Are we going to play a game of steal the bacon? Are we going to... Connect four. Um, yeah, connect four. That, that'd be really good. You know, I, I, I think that'd be a little bit tough to play with like four or five, maybe just a round robin of connect four. I'm, I'm open to all possibilities. But yes, it does feel like we're going to come down to that with just a, a cluster of these 10 and two teams in the SEC. Do you have any idea what, and this is the fifth tiebreaker capped relative total scoring margin versus all conference opponents among the tied teams. That is a word salad right there, my man, but it must mean something to someone in the SEC office. Yeah, no, right. Like at that point, then let's just play connect four. Let's just do that. That, that seems like it would make a lot more sense. Everybody knows the rules of Connect Four. Like we, we can all kind of figure this out. Everybody, you know, there, there shouldn't be any cheating or anything like that. Just handle your business. Literally, Connect Four, and you'll be fine. Who go go? So go to your crystal ball. If you go, Ole Miss, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, Texas A and M, Texas. Those are your six teams that right now are kind of vying for the four spots. Maybe who who's getting left out when it's all said and done. I, you know, as of right now, if chalk played out, it would be Texas and Alabama playing in an SEC championship, if I'm not mistaken. Now, uh, that comes down to conference winning percentage, of, you know, a winning percentage of conference opponents that, that you played. Um, so that's going to be a little bit uh, difficult to figure out right now. But I think as of right now, that would mean that Alabama and Texas would go. And I would think that's still the most likely scenario. Now, does, does that guarantee that Texas is going to beat Texas A&M a couple of weeks in College Station? No. I, I think that there's definitely a world in which A&M, with that atmosphere, can frustrate a Texas team that kind of quietly doesn't have a lot of those quality wins. And with all due respect to Arkansas, um, I, I wouldn't say that all of a sudden beating the Hogs the way that they did um, by double digits, but I don't think that's all of a sudden going to vault to the top of their resume. So I would still say that Texas has kind of that inside track to be able to do it. Um, I question kind of the upside with A&M, but I would say that, yeah, Alabama and Texas playing um, in Atlanta in the SEC championship is your most likely scenario. Uh, but there's also potentially six SEC teams that could have a 10-2 and two record going into championship week. You're not getting six teams into the playoffs. So how is it that you separate these clubs? Is it a matter of best win, worst loss, how they're playing at that moment? Because I think the worst loss is Ole Miss against Kentucky, but don't, Ole Miss might be playing the best in the league right now. And don't be down to your third-string quarterback. How about that? There's a good – there's that another good be on the, That should be on the thing right there, yeah. Yeah, look, this is, a, this is a mess to figure out because you can't just go by head-to-head. You know, Tennessee fans are going to be frustrated tomorrow night when they're kind of at the – the, the back end of the caboose of these potential 10 and two teams, because Tennessee fans are going to say, well, we beat Alabama. Why are we beat? Why are we ranked behind Alabama? Like, oh, okay, well, Alabama beat Georgia is like, how's that going to work? Is Georgia then going to be ranked behind Tennessee after what happened on Saturday night? Tennessee fans only want to apply the head to head logic to their team. They don't want to apply it to everybody else because it falls apart when you do it with everybody else, because with how big these conferences are and not everybody playing each other, you have a lot of these teams at the top that, that didn't play each other, or maybe they played two teams that are going to potentially be sitting there at 10 and two. So I think Tennessee is the team that's, that's going to need some help. They need chaos to be able to happen because Ole Miss, yeah, they might have the worst loss, but they beat South Carolina like a drum in Columbia as well. So in addition to beating Georgia convincingly in ways that, Nobody had beaten Georgia outside of, you know, an Alabama team. Nobody had beat Georgia like that in a long time. I think, to me, I think Ole Miss is going to be in a much better position than Tennessee. I do want to ask you what, what's going on there with LSU, but first I want, I want to ask you, do you think, are you with it? I, I've said Dylan Gabriel is the best college quarterback. Quinn Ewers is the best pro prospect. That's, that's just me evaluating right there. Do you have Oregon? Are they okay? Do you think they really are the best team in the country? Yeah, you know, I was at, one of my buddies actually texted me on Saturday, who's a Georgia fan. We played at Georgia, and he said, like, Connor, what's the possibility that Oregon can lose this game to Wisconsin? 
and still stay at number one. Because, guys, think about it. Ohio State lost to Oregon. Ohio State sitting there at number two. Texas, um, again, Texas's resume doesn't include those quality wins to all of a sudden put them at number one. Like, their best win right now is against Colorado State. You know, like, that's still, uh, there's a lot to be desired there. And you're not going to move Penn State all the way up to number one. So, uh, Indiana, all of a sudden, they get to be number one? Look, uh, in my biased opinion, um, maybe they should be getting more love. Maybe they shouldn't. But th- that was the question that was thrown out there. And I think Oregon, you know, won a game that, very easily it could have lost but to me they still have shown the most and they have still shown that they have what it takes in the trenches that defensive line that dan lanning has can absolutely win a national championship and Dylan gabriel yeah he's one of the most accomplished quarterbacks that we've had in this sport in some time and he's going to be all over the ncaa record books when it's all said and done so yeah i have no problem saying that oregon's the best team as of right now but you know, will will that be the case in a few weeks and what, when they get maybe possibly that rematch against Ohio State the Big Ten Championship? I don't know. And you mentioned South Carolina. It's just think of some of the, the, the young quarterbacks, the guys who didn't even start the first game of the year. You know I mean? Like Nico Iyama-Leava, we've been hearing about him for two years. DJ Lagway, I mean, coming off of, of an injury and playing the way that he did against LSU. Lenora Sellers, the way he's played for – South Carolina wasn't even the starter to begin the season, if I remember. And then Marcel Reed. I mean, these are uh, A&M's already good, but I'd, I'd be watching out. Carolina right now is playing great. Next year, they are they may end up being improved. And, hey, I think a lot of folks expected Billy Napier to be fired by now. Um, and it isn't just because I don't think that there's going to be any changes in SEC football coaching um, is the reason why he's going to be there is because he's got a quarterback that believes in him and he's playing really well. Got a quarterback, you got a chance. I mean, that's that's the the name of the game. If you don't, uh, forget about it. I mean, that's that's just reality. And you know, South Carolina did something unique that's pretty atypical in this day and age of the transfer portal. They actually looked at their situation to replace Spencer Rattler and thought, what are, what are we going to do? Could we go into the portal and get somebody like Malik Murphy coming over from Texas? Can we get one of these guys who could be moving within the SEC? Probably not going to be able to spend big enough to get someone like Cam Ward. Uh, let's instead just trust our development and trust that Lenora Sellers is going to be the guy. He, he was a starter at the start of the year, but they were kind of working in Robbie Ashford as well and kind of doing some things with him. And then Sellers was getting banged up in some of these games early on. And what he has been coming off of the bye week in these last three games is special, really, really special. Once a game, guys, he does the thing that KJ Jefferson used to do when KJ was at his peak at Arkansas, that dude could shake someone off like a rag doll keep his eyes downfield and perfectly target someone 20, 25 yards downfield and just pretend like it was nothing. And that's exactly what Lenora Sellers is doing. You're right. I mean, he's a redshirt freshman. He should be back next year, and they're going to have something to build on. South Carolina has turned into one of the scariest teams in all of college football. They're not going to make the playoff with three losses, but there are not probably 10 teams in the sport that are scarier than they are with what they have on that defensive line and what they're developing with Lenora Sellers. And, oh, by the way, a healthy Rocket Sanders. I don't need to tell Arkansas fans how special a healthy Rocket Sanders is. Connor, there, uh, you know, a lot of people, I, I guess, in the media, they say who ha- has had a Heisman moment yet, and, and I don't know who's had the Heisman moment yet. My my front runner is Travis Hunter uh, for for Heisman. The amount of plays he plays, every, uh, over a hundred plays every game. Just he's so impactful on the game. A lot of people have Janty up there at Boise State as the favorite. Who do you have top two, top three right now in the clubhouse for your Heisman? Uh, Travis Hunter. I, I'm, I'll be surprised if Travis Hunter doesn't win the Heisman at this point. And think about it, too, because, you know, things can happen over the course of the next few weeks. Maybe Colorado ruins a chance to play for a Big 12 championship, or maybe it gets just walloped in a Big 12 championship or, or something like that, right? But even if Travis Hunter gets hurt, and then that happens. The amount of snaps that that guy has played, playing both ways at a high level, I would, to me, say this guy is playing two games every time he steps onto the football field. So why would I penalize him for, for missing a game here or there or something like that? But to me, what he's done is just so unbelievably unique. It's, it's more impressive than what Charles Woodson did 27 years ago. It, it is just phenomenal to think about this guy and what he has been able to do at playing both ways at such a high level, it's such a fun thing to watch. It is, for me, when I watch at home on Saturdays, I get Colorado on a multi-view every single week, and it's got nothing to do with Dion or even Shadur, to be honest with you. It's all because I want to watch Travis Hunter play football. And to me, 
if that's not Heisman material, and I, I, to me, that, that just defines everything that, that we should aspire to reward when it comes to having the greatest player in college football recognized. I need, I need your thoughts on the Arkansas offense. And, you know, I mean, we all just expect it, I guess, because Bobby Petrino would be the offensive coordinator. That, that We had conversations about how many points does that add to them on a game-by-game you know, game yeah. basis and all of that. And maybe it does help add two more wins, but it's just the defense has been better than the offense this year. Struggling to pass protect. Uh, Taylor Green definitely showing positive signs, but then, you know, also showing signs that there's still plenty to develop. Um, and... and you know, we just expected Petrino's some magician. He's going to automatically, you get seven more points a game. It hasn't been like that. What, what, is, your, what is your thought, your idea, take, if you want to call it that, on, on what you've seen from the Razorback offense under Bobby Petrino this year? I think it's been herky-jerky. The explosive plays have been there. There have been so many times this year where you felt like, wow, this is so different than what, whatever that was last year with Dan Enos. This is an offense that feels like it's, it's got some promising pieces that you can build around. And I think the approach and the takeaway from this season is there's still enough to like with Taylor green, but I, I think some of the consistency that really he's lacked was, is more a reflection of who he was at Boise state as well. I mean, that, that was kind of the, the scouting report on him at the end of his time at Boise State, in which, by the way, he was teaming up with Ash and Genty, and they, that was a fun one-two punch to watch, but they obviously had other issues on that team. And he was a guy that still was just too mistake-prone. And I think this year, if he had stayed healthy the entire year, maybe you'd see a little bit more consistency from him week in, week out. But him at 90% probably isn't going to be good enough on a given day to beat better teams in this conference, uh, in this conference much less you know, the top ranked SEC team in Texas. This is a guy who, in my opinion, is still going to be good enough to build around, but he needs a full offseason and he needs his full arsenal. That, that's to me, is the most important thing for who Taylor Green is as a player right now. And I still like the identity of this team, but yeah, it's frustrating. And they were overwhelmed, I thought, by that, that Texas pressure. They were doing things up front at one point. Jade Barron's coming through the A gap on third down. I mean, they, they just looked perplexed with what Texas was trying to do outside of that one drive that they had in the third quarter. Uh, Connor, has has Notre Dame figured it out? Has Leonard, their quarterback, who struggled early on it, have they figured something out? Because I, I, I haven't really heard a lot of mainstream media jumping on Notre Dame. They're kind of flying under the radar. Are you are you buying into Notre Dame? Yeah, I'm buying in that they're going to make the playoff, um, which I wouldn't have said after the Northern Illinois loss. There's no way. But, yeah, I mean, Riley Leonard has figured things out, you know, with more time in that offense, the job that Mike Denbrock has done as the OC coming over from LSU has been really important. And defensively, I mean, their defense is always going to give you a chance. They, they just are. They're, they're too good, especially in the back end. One of the best secondaries in all of college football, and it really helps that you've got two great defensive minds who are at work on that defensive side of the ball. And they're a group that has figured things out. Now, how much of that has been because their schedule's been really favorable? Uh, that's definitely part of it. I'd love to see what it looks like to have Notre Dame in a road playoff game. Can they have the poise that they showed in that first game of the year at Texas A&M? Or will they be a team that gets exposed? And that, I think, is what everybody always waits for with Notre Dame. And everybody it seems like they're waiting on the team that we saw against Northern Illinois to show up again just so that people can clown Notre Dame because that's what people like to do. Um, but, yeah, the, I think they're going to end up being playoff worthy at 11-1 and one, despite the fact that they're going to have the worst loss of anybody in the field, and it probably won't even be particularly close. Good luck on big noon kickoff on Saturday, Connor. You know me. I'll be rooting for the Hoosiers. I know you will, too. Biggest game in Indiana history. What a sentence, man. What, what a sentence it is. What a, what a time it is for us Hoosiers uh, to, to watch what's unfolding. Uh, all gravy at this point. Um, just – don't give me a 42 to three result in which I have to then kind of awkwardly explain whether or not Indiana deserves to make the playoff at 11 and one. I I just don't want to have those conversations, It's a a competitive football game. And then we can all, you know, let the the chips fall where they may. Good man, Connor. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your time. Thanks guys. Thanks Connor. Connor O'Gara Saturday down South with us on halftime today. Bet online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for online betting. From the earliest odds to in-game live betting, Bet Online provides you with all the action and the ability to watch the games as they happen. With the largest selection of odds on everything from football, NBA, and college basketball, NHL to UFC and MMA. 
Head to Bet Online today to get in on the action with America's most trusted site for online wagering. Bet Online, the game starts here.